Welcome back to our series on learning to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. In the last segment, I mentioned that we would talk about discerning what we hear, but I realized that in this segment, we really need to focus more on how to actually hear the voice of the Lord and then next time talk about the discernment process. So this segment's going to be longer than the others because it's really the heart of what we're all about. When we spoke last time, we said we should be praying that God would do for us what he did for the psalmist in Psalm 40, where the psalmist says that God opened his ear that he might hear. And remember in the Hebrew, that is literally God dug out his ear. In other words, he cleared the psalmist's ear of distraction, noise, clutter, so that he might clearly hear the voice of God. That should be our prayer today, that the Lord would clear away any kind of noise, any kind of impediment to our hearing, because he desires deeply to commune with us, in great part by communicating with us. So in what ways does God speak to us today that we might hear? There are a number of ways, but you might be surprised and disturbed by the first and primary way that God speaks to us. And that is through his word, through the sacred scripture. So why would this be a surprise? Well, I think for many of us who want to hear the Lord's voice, we don't often first think of going to the scriptures. We want some sort of easier revelation because the scriptures do take some time and study to understand them. However, if we want to really learn and apply God's word, we have to remember that the scriptures are God's love letter to us. He's taken great pains and gone to great lengths to work with and through the sacred authors to reveal his love and his plan for us. So we need to go there. We need to take this great gift that God has given to us and open it up quite literally and figuratively. I think this can be easily likened to the parable that Jesus talks about with regards to the kingdom of the man who finds the buried treasure in the field and he goes off sells all that he has so that he can buy that field and have that treasure. We need to dig for the treasures that are in the Word of God, and God will richly reward us for our labor. Jesus, as you know, is called the Word made flesh, and as such, his Word had tremendous power. It had the power to calm the raging seas, the power to rebuke raving demons, the power to heal those who were sick and ill, the power to bring about miraculous change in people's lives, to even raise the dead. That same word needs to get into us, needs to become flesh in us, in order for God to have his desired effect in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So you may ask, how is a sacred scripture as God's primary and first way of speaking to us disturbing? I'd like you to consider a quote by St. Jerome. St. Jerome translated the scriptures from their original languages into the Latin, and he said this, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Ugh. <laughs> oh. right? What did he mean by that? What he meant was, if we don't know Jesus of the Gospels, we don't know Jesus in his totality. And if Jesus is the Word made flesh, what word is he referring to? He's referring to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, which is by far the vast majority of the Bible. Now that can seem overwhelming. How can we possibly know all of that and know it soon? God doesn't expect us to know it all and to know it quickly. But what he asks of us is to take a step in faith, day by day, slowly studying the word, ruminating over it, letting it have an impact in our lives. And this can be done not easily, but much easier than in the past because we have so many resources that are available today that we didn't have before to help us to understand the word in its context, to find out what it meant then, what it means now, how to apply it to our lives. 
And in the video description, we have several resources listed for you to take advantage of. Also, if we want to hear Jesus speaking to us, as we mentioned the last time, wouldn't it be important that we already know the basics of God's revealed word that would serve as a foundation for God to lead us even deeper in hearing his voice? In John's Gospel in the Last Supper Discourses, Jesus says that the Spirit of Truth, meaning the Holy Spirit, will remind you of all that I taught you. How can we be reminded of something that is not in us already? I've had the great blessing of being able to study the scriptures since my late teens, so I'd like to share with you the fruit of some of that. First of all, even though I never tried to really memorize the scriptures, just the mere repetition of reading them over and over, that word has gotten into me. And so there are times when I'll be able to quote, not verbatim, but pretty close, some passages from the scripture when people need a reference. But more importantly, when I've gone to pray for a direction in a particular situation, often a scripture will come to mind that has the potential of pointing me in the direction where God wants me to go. And that's been extremely useful in my life. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to have the scriptures in us so that he might use them to our advantage. How else might God be speaking to us in addition to the sacred scriptures? When we're listening quietly, we may hear a word or words. We might hear a phrase. We might see an image in our mind. Maybe even a song will come to us. Or just an impression that God is leading me in a certain way. Those are all ways that God communicates to us, if you will, speaks to us. And we should be attentive to those things in prayer. Start with the small stuff. Ask the Lord to direct you in something simple and follow his lead and see what the fruit of it is. For example, when you're having your morning prayer and you're making your plans for the day, offer those plans to the Lord. Ask him, is this what you want me to do? And is this the order you want me to do them? And listen for his response. See what you feel he is leading you to do. He might change your plans. And follow that and see what the fruit of it is. It's trial and error in this. It's not going to be suddenly all clear all at once. But God delights in the fact that we're trying to lean our heart into him and do what he wants us to do. He will reward that. You know, there's something startling I've learned over the years, and that is this. Common sense is not always God's sense. Or put it another way, a good idea is not always God's idea. I mean, think how many times in the scriptures you've seen Peter or the other apostles think they understand Jesus' intention and Jesus has to intervene before they make a major mistake, right? We all go through that. If it's okay with you, I'd like to end with a personal story that illustrates this point. Many years ago, when I was in Arizona to give a series of presentations, I had the day off and I was planning to go on Sunday to the 11 o'clock Mass. And uh, I said to the Lord, I'm going to spend my quiet time with you an hour in prayer beforehand and go to the 11. But as I was praying, I felt this spiritual impulse that I should go to the nine o'clock mass. And I said to the Lord, no, I think it'd be better if I spent my time alone with you first and then went to mass. I'll get a lot more out of it. But that impulse would not go away. So having had experience with this before, where I felt the Lord was redirecting me, and I followed it, there was always good fruit. But when I went against it and did my own thing, it never ended well. So I thought, okay, I'll go to the nine. I went to the nine, great liturgy. It was all over, the whole church cleared out. Finally, I get uninterrupted quiet time with the Lord. Until a couple minutes later, I heard someone quietly weeping 
all the way across the sanctuary of this large church. I was in a bit of a dilemma. Do I get up and go over and talk to her? Maybe she wants to be left alone. I really didn't know what to do, but I thought, I'll go over and see. So when I got close to her, in order not to startle her, I said, um, would you like to talk? And she turned around and she said yes. And she began to pour out her heart and the struggle that she and her husband were enduring. They were supposed to move, but they lost their jobs. They didn't even know how they were gonna make rent. So we talked for a little while. Then I said to her, do you remember in Matthew's Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, why are you worried about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear? The pagans are running after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need him. See how he takes care of the flowers of the field and the birds of the air. How much more valuable are you than they? Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you besides. And she said, yes, I remember that passage. And I said, I think maybe that's where the Lord wants you now, is to not worry, but to seek him first. Seek his direction, seek his counsel, seek his comfort, and let him guide you. And she agreed to that. And I asked her if we could pray together, and we did. And when it was all over, she had such a look of relief on her face. She was actually smiling. And I said to her, you know, God is amazing. I was gonna to come to the 11 o'clock mass, but I felt like he wanted me to come to the nine. Had I not come to the nine, we would have never met. And she said, I wasn't at the nine. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I was driving by the church and I just felt like I was supposed to stop here and pray. And I said, oh my gosh, that's amazing. She said, yes. And she said, my prayer to the Lord was, I know that you love me, but if you love me, send someone to talk to me. I was about in tears at this point, and I said, does he love you? He sent some Yahoo from 2,000 miles away to be here at this moment to reassure you that he loves you. Wow, what a faith builder for her and for me. We need to lean in on the heart of the Lord. He wants to speak to us. He wants to use us mightily for his glory. If we were just to do that every day, wouldn't the world be an, an amazingly different place? Next time, we'll talk about how to discern what we're hearing and what to do about it. Let's conclude with our prayer of consecration to the Holy Spirit. On my knees before the great multitude of heavenly witnesses, I offer myself soul and body to you eternal Spirit of God. I adore the brightness of your purity, the unerring keenness of your justice, and the might of your love. You are the strength and light of my soul. In you I live and move and am. I desire never to grieve you by unfaithfulness to grace, and I pray with all my heart to be kept from the smallest sin against you. Mercifully guard my every thought and grant that I may always watch for your light and listen to your voice and follow your gracious inspirations. I cling to you and give myself to you and ask you by your compassion to watch over me in my weakness. Holding the pierced feet of Jesus and looking at his five wounds and trusting in his precious blood and adoring his open side and stricken heart. I implore you, adorable spirit, helper of my infirmity, to keep me in your grace that I may never sin against you. Give me grace, O Holy Spirit, Spirit of the Father and the Son, to say to you always and everywhere, Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. Amen.